Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 30 of the Eat for Life podcast. Your host, Marcus Howard. Well, we were going to bring on uh, Owen from, from um, Black Salt Corruption. But I think he's also in the process of closing some make it this evening. Uh, but, you know, still a lot to talk about. I think uh, Mrs. Ziza from last week, you know, she's a regular uh, listener and, and supporter of the show. I think she wanted to join in. I don't know if she's alive here. Let me go check. But yeah, I want to shout out everyone who is listening, everyone who's joining us uh, live for a chat again. You know, we've, we've got some some extra space here uh, in the virtual space, in the metaverse, if you will. You're welcome to join us. One of the things I'm most excited for while we wait for that is this upcoming Spider-Man movie, man. We're going to explode with whether or not there's actually going to be multiple Spider-Man. Because in the trailer, they, they edited out at least three. They were supposed to have brought back Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield from the first two iterations of Spider-Man, along with, uh, I forget the name of the guy who's the current one. Hustle is real. If the one, uh, you know, they see the trailers drop and then want to get some of those views, get some of those ad dollars. It's impressive. They might still have that kind of old school mentality. They only take resumes. I think if you're trying to be scrappy, right? You're trying to to, to crowdsource. Leverage the crowd. Yeah, I've seen that too. I don't know if you saw Nintendo recently like officially supported a Smash Brothers tournament. They are way behind on the times. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know why they, they didn't officially support it, but I know that Nintendo's already been, or has always been kind of like draconian in terms of their IP. Um, I've seen like tons of fan games that get spun up and then like very quickly they'll get DMCAs or like cease and desist, like actual cease and desist letters. I mean, you know, they're protective of their IP and they should be, but there's, I think this ecosystem is evolving away from like publisher and gamer to like strategic partners, right? Like it's like an, an organic community. So hopefully this is, this is a closer indication of that, that shift. They have every right to be. I think it hurts them in the long run because it, just like when you see like these parody videos or whatever, like fan films, it's basically free marketing. So why wouldn't you leverage that? So Nintendo a couple of years ago had like a content creators program because of the DMCA stuff that was happening on YouTube four, maybe five years ago. And, and they were trying to find a solution where it was the best of both worlds, but it was like very strict. Um, basically undermine the whole purpose of putting the program together. Yeah, I think it was just a bit 
heavy handed. It's Okay. Um, LinkedIn is telling me that it is live. It says that we have three people viewing, but it's also giving me the spinning wheel of death. Like I told you, I, I need a new computer. So I might not be the best person to judge that. Okay. Well, while we're waiting to hear back from uh, either Aziza or Owen, or, or you know, if, if Red or, or Chosen can uh, join us, what are your thoughts? I don't know if you saw Phase Clan recently announced a partnership with DraftKings. Uh, it's supposed to be a landmark opportunity for DraftKings, like leaning into esports, and they chose Phase Clan to do that. Yeah, I just found out about it a couple hours ago. Um, Chris Laporte posted something about it. And ironically, I, I was on a panel yesterday for uh, Beyond Games, the uh, one of the gaming industry uh, events. And the panel was about like striking a balance between profitability or business and authenticity with brand deals, like partnerships. And I, the co-hosts and the other panelists were kind of like sort of talking around without saying a specific name, like a, a question of, of whether certain brand deals are off the table or if there, is everything on the table. And it seemed like they had all, I guess, seen that announcement. I hadn't seen it. So I, I gave a very neutral, unbiased response. If I had known that FaZe Clan was a part of it, it might have been more negative than neutral. And I'm still trying to, to work through uh, my personal issues with the phase clan but I, I think by and large it's it's good for the ecosystem right you want to see more and more technically non-endemic brands getting into the space um, you know traditional sports has betting left and right so that's not a new concept my concern here is twofold one like i said on, on the panel yesterday or i guess friday it's gamers are all ages right you know six to 76 so you've got people who are old enough to gamble. But I think, especially for these teams and orgs, all of their ecosystem is all kind of lumped together, regardless of the age of, of the audience member. So I think it's very difficult to say, hey, let's bring DraftKings in and advertise to people who are only 18 and up, who, have, who can legally gamble without influencing those who are under 18 who cannot legally gamble. Even if they don't have the ability to log into the platform, you're promoting gambling right, to minors. That's a good point. That's a good point. I can't argue with that logic. Yeah, I guess if you you, you want to think, go ahead. Good point. That's a good point. Uh, my other issue, and, and maybe this is water under the bridge now, but several years ago, FaZe Banks, right, who's one of the owners of FaZe Clan, uh, and I guess by extension, FaZe Clan owned and operated a skins, a CSGO skins betting site that more or less catered to minors. 
like they were actively having kids bet who were under the age of 18. So, it, and I think anything can be addictive. I don't, I don't necessarily want to make betting the boogeyman, but I think there's a reason that there's legislation coming up about loot boxes, you know, particularly younger people don't quite understand what it does to you psychologically. And, and it could be negatively habit forming and, and potentially dangerous to that extent. I have seen, uh, what was it? Sean, Sean Mendez Catalina, who was one of our guests, he wrote an article about it. I think it's, it's in some court, I don't have the details in front of me, but I know that it is becoming a topic of conversation in the, the legal space. I think it's a combination of that and the misperception that that there it's the illusion of chance and choice, I think, is the issue. I think there's not enough chance is what they're arguing, is that it's basically like you might as well be taking a, you know, a seat at a slot machine is what the odds are. Again, I'm not not. Uh, well versed if, if Sean was here in the audience we could add him on but I, I don't have the, the expertise for that by the way if you're here joining us live you'll uh just give us a shout out and say hey in the comments so we can see who you are I see we got seven people live but it doesn't give me names um you know we want to give you a shout out thank you for listening and joining and, and join us in the conversation if you have any questions glad to answer those So with chance, uh, so there's a like a piece of Python code, it's like math.random. And then you basically give it a starting number and then an ending number. So it can be zero to one, zero to 5,000. And then the application just like, when it calls that function, just picks a random number out of that set. Like, so it could be, if you're picking one to 100 each time you call, so you tell it call 10 times, it'll pick, zero and then 26 and 64 it's just a random number generator it basically picks one my guess is that it's probably programmed to be less than random or or the range is so high that even though it's a random it's still like in favor of the house if you will All right, so Red's in the audience, ironically. She said that your mic's not picking up. Just shout out to Red. If you can join us, Red, be glad to have you on the, the podcast. Uh, obviously, you're one of the co-hosts. If you're still having some, some uh, technical difficulties there, definitely sound off in the, the chat. You know, you're, you're one of the squad, so you're welcome up here. Uh, we've got Howard Beach from FitGamer. He says... he. Fit gamer creates a healthy habit tracking app for gamers. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's also saying that <laughs> Derek, me? your audio is oh, not picking up. Yeah, for you. Tell him mic check one, two. Can you hear him now, Howard? Red? He said you're moving your lips, but they're not hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> this should be good now. Okay. So Howard, if you want to join us uh, while we're on the topic of healthy habits and gaming, uh, we haven't had that conversation enough, uh, not only on the podcast, but in the gaming industry in general. 
do you want to join? Nope. Nope, you can't hear him or nope, you don't want to join the podcast. I think they still can't hear you. You still can't hear me. Mic check one, two. Okay, he says he hears it now and it's low. All right. Mic check one, two. Mic check. Check. Can you hear him now, Howard? Shout out to our live uh, audience. Mike checking this. <laughs> it takes a village to, to raise a human, <laughs> to raise a child, and it takes a community to get our podcast from one episode to the next. <laughs> All right, so Howard does want to join. So right. what I'll do is I'll send this link over to him. Howard, keep an eye out for your DMs. I'm sending you a link now. Oh, I thought I was. My computer's running real slow. Yeah, it's taking. There we go. <laughs> Mic check one, two. Appreciate you, Howard. Thank you for uh, troubleshooting us. And I'll send you a connection request as well. We're not connected, or at least we weren't, but I just sent you a connection request. If you check your, your inbox on LinkedIn, you've got a link to join us in the chat. And let's, let's talk about uh, healthy game habits, not non-unhealthy -un gaming habits, the opposite of healthy. <laughs> oh, Matt. You gotta, go ahead. Uh, here, here's Howard, letting Howard in. Hey, hey. Hey, what's going on, Howard? Appreciate you oh, joining oh, us. Oh, look at that. We actually have a real conversation. What's going on? <laughs> good, good. Howard, how's it going? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for the troubleshooting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it was just low voice and I have bad hearing. Tell us a little about your background <laughs> and FitGamer. Uh, well, FitGamer is a habit tracking app that's been in development for the last uh, four plus years um, in real life with uh, Cloud9. We, we train in person Cloud9's teams, physical fitness, um, uh, mental conditioning, lifestyle, nutrition, sleep. We help and we train them with that. And we've used the science backgrounds of uh, our founder, Holden McRae, who spent 31 years at uh, Pepperdine University, where he retired as the Chairman Emeritus of Sports Science. Basically, it's a, it's really jaw-droppingly beautiful content app for that will get any gamer or any anybody physically fit without any equipment and with no at no no other charge, no other fee. You don't you don't need equipment and you don't need experience. And you know. I'm not a gamer myself, but I, I've been in and around the game industry for a really long time. I don't want to date myself, but you might see a power glove up there, which <laughs> was a product that I, I actually developed for Mattel. Okay. Various iterations through the years of working with uh, the video game companies and launching an advertising network for video games in Walmart. But um, I came across some, some folks from my relationship with friends in the space and relayed my passion for physical fitness, which has kind of like gotten into hyperspeed since the pandemic. And with the advent of all these devices that help you to measure where you're at, I've figured out how to feel better, sleep better, perform better um, in, in life and at work through physical fitness. And that's what this app does for kids. And we are uh, looking to push it down as far as middle school. We have a middle school version that we're working on right now. And we're going to push it down to those kids to start to get them and their parents comfortable with the idea that their kids can be better humans while they're being better gamers and they can do it with less time at the keyboard. So that's sort of the premise of it all. And 
you know, it, it, it's been getting a great reception. Because if you think about it, we help everybody in this community, right? Fit, if, if gamers are healthier, if they're spending less time at the keyboard, but playing better, their parents are happier, they're happier. Uh, it's a wonderful experience for all involved. And what we're doing at its very core is also creating this gigantic database of physical fitness information that can be used to show educators and parents and kids themselves and coaches that their kids are getting the exercise that they need and they're getting healthy and there's accountability there. So that's really what we do. And it's been wonderful to work with. We have a very diverse staff of people. Holden's been in the sports science space for his entire life and worked at the Red, Perfor Red Bull high performance team. We have, on, on the, that's on the upper end, on the, on the younger end, we've got Landing Gorbenko, who is in charge of our uh, mental, uh, mental fitness, mental conditioning and practice. Sports psychologist has been a gamer since he's four years old, was obese as a child, made fun of, was had bouts of depression and used physical fitness and gaming to get himself into a place where he is now, which is an outdoor enthusiast, a healthy lifestyle, uh, gamer who has an unbelievable passion for the space. He's the one that works with the teams that we coach. We coach in person. We coach uh, through our Discord server virtually all over Europe. We have uh, a, we have a, a, a yogic master on our end, Peter uh, Fergo, who who does uh, these wonderful meditation and yoga podcasts and uh, videos are on the app. We've got Mike Anderson, co-founder with his wife, Kristen, both CrossFit enthusiasts, athletes. One comes from intense financial background with all kinds of history and how to build companies. And the other built CrossFit Malibu, in which is the only CrossFit gym in all of uh, that area. And was a student of Holden who was at, at Pepperdine and is now a professor there. So, I, I mean, all of these wonderful people coming together bringing nutrition sense and um, you know, physical fitness videos and content that will get you engaged at a very minimal level, two minutes at a time, you know, or longer. It's just, it's been, it's been a great journey. And I was, I've been following you and I saw, I just got a note that said that you were live and you were talking about this. And I'm like, wow, I, I want to see what's going on there. Let me ask you, awesome. uh, how, how do you feel hey, about... Red, Red joined us. Red joined us. Thank you for joining us, Red. Yeah, thanks, George. Hey, Red. What's up, Derek? How can I help? I, I was going to ask, how do you feel about uh, being so... Um, a developer for the space, but not actually of the space? How does that happen? Well, yeah, you know, I how do I feel about it? I feel better about it knowing that at least I've been in and around it for a good portion of my career. I mean, I was selling... I was selling video games, licensing Nintendo games, um, working for publishers. I sold, I'm going to date myself, CompUSA, Computer City, Circuit City, you know, jewel cases. With Wim Stocks is how I got into this business. Everybody okay. knows Wim. Uh, he and I worked together in the 90s while he was the king of the CD-ROM jewel case business. And, you know, we, we stayed in touch and he got me back into the space. And it was really eye-opening for me to see the passion that that was here to look at the number of people who are doing it and yet recognize how little parents even supported it like how does how does that how, how do numbers and mass survive like that without your parents even supporting it and so i'm thrilled to be able to be in the space providing valuable insight and application for these gamers that is not necessarily game related. You know, um, the guy who who's on the sideline of the football team that's taking care of those guys on, you know, and their health and their injuries isn't playing the game. You know, he might not have never played the game, but he is a vital part of that team. And I consider what I do as important as what the other members of our team do, because all of us together are very strong and 
I'm never going to overstep the bounds and, and even pretend to know what I'm talking about there. I will get better. I will learn and grow and understand that. But um, I feel okay about that. And fortunately, the people that I interact with every day seem to be okay with that too. Um, what do you feel like is a recipe for disaster when it comes to uh, the opposite effects of gaming? So right now you're working towards uh, health improvement, mental health improvement, but what's a recipe that makes it go the other way that you've seen in the space? A recipe meaning if like depression, so the, so the, the, loneliness. I think, I'm sorry, what were you saying there? Like depression, yeah. loneliness. Um, uh, yes, I, I'm. Look, I'm going to say again. I'm not as into the space as some gamers are and understand. And because I picked this up mostly in the pandemic, mm -hmm. I haven't even been able to see that many live events. So all I have to go on is the expertise of the people that I work with, like Landon, who talk about his own journey and recognizes that in others. And you can read about so many of these gamers who are dropping out early, professional who have you know, burned out or physically aren't able to continue, mm -hmm. right? If you're serious about the sport and you wanna live and uh, through your you know, late 20s and into your 30s and still game competitively, you have to be physically fit, you know? Uh, you have to be able to endure that kind of, uh, of outcome. And it doesn't take much to not be able to do that and to succumb to that. So what we hope to do and what, this, what the Fit Gamer app does so nicely is it, it really is a very approachable way to answer questions about how you're sleeping, how you're eating, how you're exercising, how you're gaming, right? How much rage did you experience on a scale of one to 10? Did you tilt? What were your, did you do your pre-workout meditations? How did you feel after you played? And then really talking to you about rating some of the personal interactions that you had during that day. What I found so helpful about you know, taking this approach is to hear from the likes of people that we work with, like Chris Avilas, if you're familiar with Chris, you know, uh, from a middle school perspective, a high school perspective, what esports athletes need and students need out of this. I look to him for that. I hear stories about what's going on with these kids and, and how important gaming is to them to keep their mental health together. And if and what we're asking them to do in our app is already the things that Chris is asking 107 schools to do manually now. So now we're able to look and say, what's happening with all of these kids? There's 2,160 kids or something like that that are under his purview in that area there. If we can, if we can get them the Fit Gamer app and they can start to take what they were doing by hand and put it on paper. And now it gives the coach the ability to see the data too, right? So it's not just the it's not just the gamer and the student, but it's the coach and the parent. And they get to look and see what's going on there. So they can intervene and they can ask questions and they can help them out. And so I think when you're if if we can get more kids thinking like this, the less of the I think the less depression and issues physically and mentally they will have. That's, you know, that's what I, that's what I believe. And I'm also encouraged by studies. I, I don't have the source directly in front of me, but I know that the majority of Gen Zers age nine to 24 believe that eating right and being healthy is important to being a functioning a grown up, <laughs> you know, they, they believe they really do contrary to belief are conscious of their health and want to do the right things. But I don't believe that they're given the tools and not, I won't dive off on the tangent about what I'm learning about the processed food and sugar industries and, and how hard it is to be able to help kids. I mean, nutrition is probably the number one, besides sleep, nutrition is the number one thing that can help all of us live better lives and be less depressed. Well, appreciate it. Thank you, Howard, for stopping in. 
thank you so much for having me. I did not expect to be on camera. <laughs> I, my media people will obviously, you know, have to review the tape and give me some pointers. Appreciate it, Howard. Thank you. Welcome back, Red. What's How was home, Vegas? Red? No, we uh, don't hear you. you can y'all hear me now? Yes. I now we can hear you. I'm muted. Um, Vegas was cool. It was it was dope. Uh, how <laughs> um, I briefly heard what, what Howard said, but yeah, Vegas was interesting because <laughs> I went to a music festival, especially um, you know post the whole Travis Scott uh, disaster. You might as well say, Derek, I got a chance to read your article, and um, you brought up a lot of great points. Um, Especially since, um, let me, let me ask you, did, did it read as if I was saying that the problem were the kids? No, no, oh. all right, <laughs> just making sure. Yeah, um, some people comprehend differently. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't take that from that from your article. Uh, it's just that, um, what you there's multiple factors, you know, that that like that disaster alone is so many multiple factors to it. And, um, you know, I see the case in the production company, uh, a lot on what was happening with that. Uh, I seen a video from like 2019 of a, a sneaker influencer that I follow. Uh, and he showed footage of his 2019, you know, at Astro, uh, Astro world fest, and it looked like nothing has changed, you know, all the way up until, you know, the recent events, the not being organized. So I went to a day in Vegas. That was my, this is my second festival I've ever went to. My first that I ever engaged into the crowd because <laughs> uh, my first festival was Afropunk and I was like behind the scenes on a lot of stuff. And then I wanted to then go out and see, and, you know, I was covering it. So I didn't really go into the crowd that much. I kind of seen things from afar and the festival at that time I went to, which was years ago, it wasn't as big as it is now as far as Afro punk. So shouts out to them. But being in the crowd and people was going to push. So let me just tell y'all your girl turned it to She-Hulk because I was like, <laughs> this is not happening here. <laughs> this is not happening here. It's not happening. I don't know what y'all thought was about to happen. I'm not from here, from New York. It's not happening <laughs> at all. Um, but you could tell a lot of a lot of kids that were there, like young adults or kids, they just wanted to have fun and not recognize too that someone could be in danger. Uh, but I did enjoy what Golden Golden Voice, who um, organized the the festival. They had a lot of things in line and it made people more conscious too about being responsible for people that's next to you. Uh, so I appreciated that. I appreciate what the security was doing. He was giving out water and everything, but it was some type of experience post something that was so devastating. And uh, my mother was calling me like every day, <laughs> like every day to make sure uh, that I was OK and everything. But um, but it was phenomenal. I got to see Kendrick Lamar perform Section 80 all the way up till Dam, which was a historic event, like for real. Um, so, yeah, that was it was interesting in Vegas. Somebody won a million dollars. Well, I was there that week, kind of salty because I lost my little twenty dollars at the slots. I heard y'all was talking about <laughs> the first time gambling. <laughs> the first time ever gambling. Only time I gambled was like with a video game, but I had nothing to lose. That was just you know fake video game money. But I heard y'all speaking about um, you know, uh, loot boxes with young adults and how that can actually create some type of behavior that is like. They don't care. Like they see there's no risk. Anytime you do try for something that is random is always a risk. And um, there should be more education on that, including with, you know, paying for loot boxes and such, especially with young kids, because now it's going to become second nature to them where I was at the penny slot scared even over my twenty dollars, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, y'all brought us some some dope uh, points at that. But yeah, I had a great time about loot boxes. Um, 
it's not so much about loot boxes, I would say. It's just digital content as a whole could be addictive. Um, even from like NFTs or anything like that, it can can stroll into that because it's like I want to collect, collect. And uh, you want to know what's lucrative, what's not. Uh, it's just like with trading, you know, there's people who get addicted to trading because they don't have the knowledge on certain things on what they should invest in, what they shouldn't. The thing about loot boxes and in-game content, which has been our NFTs for years is our DLCs and in-game content is that kids don't understand the value of money. And because it's so, it's, they live in a world that's instantaneous. We didn't grow up in a world that was instantaneous when we were kids. They can get any content that they want at their fingertips. We had to wait to the next week to get our, our episode of whatever cartoon. Um, these kids just go on Netflix, Hulu, whatever the case, and click and click and get what they want. They have a privilege now. So the thing about getting a whole bunch of Robux and they don't even feel like they're going to get they behind in trouble where they use their parents' credit card and go buy Robux or if they want to buy any type of in-game skins for Fortnite. Like, I have all kinds of stories of kids getting in trouble because they just don't understand the value of money and they just think that I can get this, I can get this, and I want to be cool and, and I want to be the, the kid that got all this stuff that it can get addictive. Um, so... You know, with loot boxes is randomized, but with in-game content, Perry, you already know what you're getting. So you already know I'm getting that skin. I'm getting that content over there. I want the Gucci stuff that's in Roblox. But kids don't understand the value of what's being spent. And I think, you know, as a parent, you really have to teach your children that. You cannot let school or anybody else teach your kids that. It's something that the household has to actually relate to their child. That's the gap there too, right? Is that the, the teachers don't know. They can't provide an answer. And, and yeah, there's no economic now. class for kindergartners, which there should be. You know what I'm saying? Like we have coding now for, for kids that's in pre-K. There should also be classes on economics, economics on the things that they use every single day because as soon as they log into Ro, uh, to Roblox, there's a whole ecosystem to and you know to enjoy there's a whole you know the metaverse but the air quotes <laughs> the metaverse the the um y'all know i'm here for it the metaverse <laughs> the air quotes um there's a whole economy in roblox you know whenever there's something to pay for something there's an economy right there for it so um, they should have those things taught in, in class, the value of whatever they have that they're about to invest in. Is it an investment or is it just something that is just there to just be there materialized? So, yeah, we should have things like that teaching kids, especially in our community, because we see so much things that's so flashy. And because we have less of something, we think something materialized can hold that value and make us look like we're more valued instead of that being in our, you know, in our portfolios for our kids and our next generations to show what actual wealth means. So I definitely feel like that should be taught in the household and should be taught in educational systems too. Uh, and teachers and parents should, it's, it just can't just be on the kids, parents and teachers, uh, anyone involved in education need to inform themselves as well. I think that's, I think that's, that's tough. I don't think having a portfolio of real estate, stocks, cryptocurrency will fill the void of the material stuff to gain respect. Like those items such as real estate, they're items that are hidden away for the most part. Like you, when you come out the house, I could have a hundred. Uh, real estate properties that I'm, I'm making uh, two million a year off of, right? And if I'm not buying the stuff and wearing the stuff and driving the stuff that shows that I'm doing well in this other stuff, the other stuff isn't valuable in our community. Because like I'm, I learned I'm about real respect. estate through through Monopoly. You know what I'm saying? Like I learned about real estate through Monopoly. Things could still be 
things doesn't have to be a whole plate of information. Things can still be spoon fed. You get what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be like, boom, this is a portfolio, y'all. And yeah, we signed y'all up for TD Ameritrade. No, <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> like, it's like the kids looking at y'all like, yo, pump your brakes. <laughs> pump your brakes. Things can still be, kids are not dumb. Like these children nowadays, this Generation Z, they're not stupid. They're not being actually spoon fed information. They're actually going out and trying to get the information. They're fact checking uh, it, little kids. I think we don't give children enough credit for their intelligence, especially when we become adults. This kids sometimes know more than you or think faster than you can. So if you hit them on or expose them to a little bit of something, like I said, I learned about real estate through monopoly. It's like, you know, it's not as now one if that would have been forced it more instead of it just being a, a board game, you know, just forced it more on something. You got kids flipping sneakers like they they like, oh, I could just rock these vans because I'm getting this amount of money in my in my bank account. Like there's kids that are not dumb to the fact there's certain kids that are that are understanding what's going on and how this game is being played and what it's all about. And there's some kids that it's like. I'm a kid and I don't know that because my parents didn't know it. Right. So it, it, it depends. Everybody's not the same. Everyone doesn't have the same, but it can't be the excuse all the time as if like kids are not so intelligent and it's too much for them to understand. They see how the hustle is. They've seen it from people in their neighborhood, how they have hustled in a certain way. It's just showing that there is a there's another option that won't lead you into something that will be your demise. And it can be taught. That's just my little spiel. I was like, hold up. Monopoly taught me a lot because my mother was trying to play me. <laughs> but it, it taught me a lot about different things. Video games in a whole has taught me a lot. I think um, we always speak on topics just on esports and metaverse and NFTs and crypto. But if we break it all to the bare bones of just cognitive things, team building, understanding puzzles, like whatever the case may be, and unlock certain sectors in your brain that you really can't get from other forms of entertainment. Um, so, like I said, I, I learned a lot just off of games, um, even like in college, uh, my professor uh, in my economics class, he made things like simple that we can understand. And um, it was this gamified type. I forgot what program it was, but he was teaching us stocks. And um, it was in a gamified type of way that we would understand because he's like, okay, y'all generation play video games. Y'all could get this. And uh, it was understandable. It was, it wasn't so much. It was to the point that I went, and looked at Bloomberg, <laughs> like, to, and uh, what's the crazy guy um, that talks about stocks? Like, it made me want to know more about it. Just besides my classroom, everyone doesn't learn the same and may not do that. But at least it opened my eyes to something that I never would have thought of even talking about or thinking about. So it's there. The possibilities are there. Um. Video games taught me that uh, poor doesn't equate to anything. When you don't have resources, your man is not going to uh, equate or be able to compete with someone else that has resources. Uh, call it so do you just keep... <laughs> <laughs> so do you figure it out or you just sulk? No, you figure it out, but you're still behind. Like It doesn't change... Uh, the person that just started the game is behind the person that has already 40 hours in from a, from a, are you still able to beat that person to, to make something you, for yourself? You, you might get a, you might get a, a few couple kills, right? But if that, you had a person, squad, are you able to do it against yeah, that one person? Yeah. I guess that one person, <laughs> if they have a squad, but if they have a whole yeah. squad of 40 hours and prestige, double prestige with all the weapons and you're, you're starting out with the M nine, in a, in a uh, M4, uh, you're a little behind a little bit. You can do some damage. Not really. I mean, for example, in Call of Duty, since we're talking about Call of Duty, right? 
if you actually use the default weapons, you have an advantage. You have plane. That's in every Call of Duty. Like there's always some loophole that's right there, dead smack in your face to see what that person that has an advantage that's doing it and look at them and see what the hell they doing. Because that person that put 40 hours in is not always intelligent. No. They just figured out something. <laughs> so, like, you know what I'm saying? They just figured out something. Now, you, Derek, if you know something in the game, like, yo, Ray, you might want to put this attachment on because, right. <laughs> you know, the recall will be down. And then Marcus would be like, yo, but, yo, know, Red, if you put that stock, <laughs> that type, you know, this one stock that does X, Y, and Z, I think even, you know, us as always the, the focus of, saying we're behind all the time is because we we don't unite as much. That's why I was saying as if we if we in a squad and we keep going against that person, that person is going to get pummeled. And even against their squad, they can get pummeled like just on a video game type of, you know, aspect that can translate into life is still be pummeled. They're always they're always going to be powers that be that want to face everything. But I can't live and I can't live off of, well, you know, such and such is trying to hold you. I know the deal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know the deal. But I wake up as a black woman every day and that's not the first thing on my mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I know the deal. I know what it is. You know what I'm saying? I'm playing Demon Souls in real life. <laughs> and I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out with my brothers and sisters who leave the little notes left behind on if they, hopefully they leave the notes behind. That's how it is on Demon Souls. Um, to kind of walk me through something. And, you know, maybe I could open my eyes up bigger and see what they're doing, where they're at, where they're speaking about and put myself in those areas, too. So I can get those little notes and those little game facts to to try and do something. Uh, you know, that's the reason why we even up here right now. We figured out something or uh, had something that maybe our, our counterpart didn't. And now we're able to disperse some type of information to them. Like, yo, I never even thought about that. You know, it could be something very little. And it's like, yo, I didn't even think word. You know how they're speaking to, you know, some of your friends that had no idea about anything, but you put them on and be like, yo, according to how you move and your intellect, you could do this this way. I want nothing from it. You do that and be great at it, you know? Um, you know, that's just how it's really simple. I just need us to stop making things complicated as if like we never been here before doing what we've done. We've seen it over and over again, generation to generation. And it's just, twi- you know, tweaks and turns to kind of make it work for us in the time being. I think there's also something to be said for turning your perceived weakness into a strength. I don't know if you saw that story earlier this week or last week. There's, a, I think, a deaf team, football team in California. They had an undefeated season because they mm-hmm. were able to communicate in sign language much faster than or oh wow they, they their opponents could not keep up with the, the speed with which they were communicating with each other in sign language oh wow and so they were able to react faster as a team hmm. they went undefeated wow. and that's in crazy california? california nice that's dope Marcus, you just turned into a Van Gogh part. <laughs> no, like it, it's it's dope. I speak about Call of Duty. It's making me want to play Call of Duty right now. <laughs> uh, are you Rank on Battlefield? Yet? Uh, I have played Battlefield. Um, I didn't get a chance to play it while I was in Vegas. I tried, but the internet sucks so bad for some reason. Um, I don't know. MGM, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if y'all take all y'all resorts and just have it on one <laughs> internet, but um, it the internet was poor, so I couldn't play. But when I got home, I did play Battlefield. And I'm a big Battlefield fan. And um, y'all know I keep it 100 <laughs> at all times. It does not matter. Uh, to keep it 100 is to improve it. I would love to see any game that I don't agree with. I wanted to see it get better. It was my same problem with Destiny, which is one of my favorite games. 
The thing about Battlefield 2042 for all those have who have been fans of Battlefield for years, for me and my opinion does not feel like Battlefield. It feels like we kind of wanted to put, we kind of wanted to take Battlefield, but put essence of Battle Royale of everything out and open. And you play four different game modes in different sectors. And I'm like, it's doing too much because then you have to really strategize how the maps are in that game to make that game mode come alive. And right now that's not happening because if you have a vehicle, you're able to wreak havoc and then there's no scoreboard anymore. So I don't even know who's cheating because <laughs> that's how you know when someone is using exploits, they got 80 kills and two lives. You already know what the deal is. They're cheating. Um, they're doing something that's exploiting. I miss Rush. So break. I think what Breakthrough, which was on the previous uh, Battlefield, is a is a mode I'm just gonna be playing for for now. Uh, Portal, which comprise of old battlefields that you can play, but you can't rank up in them. So you're just playing it for the nostalgic value of playing on old maps instead of it actually giving you XP, which I don't like. So we're going to wait for this patch because I love me some Battlefield, but I'm not it's, a Battlefield when fan. I play, it's, it's, it's not, it's not Battlefielding right now. It's not, it's not Battlefielding. I needed to feel like Battlefields. Like there's not even any type of destruction. I'm like, Battlefield has been known for destruction. Like this, I want to take out a building if they are camping in the building. I want I the revolution to come back. You can't, take you out can't the do building? that anymore. Oh. No. You do it in Portal from the old Battlefields. I thought you like out Battlefield 3. Stuff. No, there's not that much destruction in that uh, game. Huh. Yeah, I've only liked Battlefield sad. 2. I've been waiting for everything to be back like Battlefield 2. That was my favorite Battlefield. A lot of people has been asking for that. My favorite Battlefield is three because they had a little bit more close quarter combat uh, with that one. And they kind of put it in the other ones after that. But um, yeah, I, I really want Rush to come back uh, because it was it, it, it was fast paced, but there was some strategy to it as well. It's not like you could just go run out there because somebody will clip you with a sniping rifle <laughs> easy. But I would love to have that pick up and pace, not that I'm spawning and I'm just getting killed over and over and over again. It's not fun anymore. There's so many options to video games that I don't have to play your game. You know, I, I can just put it to the side. The bad part is with people who have invested and bought the game and bought the season pass and everything. I feel bad for them with that because who wants to wait for patches all the time? You know, when you when the game releases, it's like, they, didn't we have betas and everything for this a QA team? So hopefully they get it together so the game could feel like Battlefield again. Yeah, I, I, I guess from my loner standpoint, I like games where I feel like I can make a significance without a team. And Battlefield, you can't do that. Like, you can't make no, any impact by your damn self. If, if your team isn't with it or participating, it don't matter. You're just going to be getting killed over and over again. And I hate games like that. Call of Duty. Hey, even if like, I like about Call of Duty. I can be fire on a trash team and still get my, <laughs> my points. I see. And that's the thing, you know, um, you know, even with Battlefield, like sometimes I'll go lone wolf. Um, I've been playing before 2042 came. I was playing Hardline. And Hardline gave a hybrid of something like Call of Duty, which can be more arcade and a mixture of Battlefield. So you have some realism. You got the bullet drops. You have the great sound of the gun, the recall of the gun. The time to kill is not long on there. And this Battlefield, it's like, damn, how much bullets do I have to pump <laughs> to somebody for them to go away. Um, the bullet drop system, it's not even a bullet drop, it's like a scatter problem. Cause I like to snipe, you know, sometimes I like to go on my lonesome and just pick everybody apart so my team could progress and take the, the sectors they need to take over. And it's not battlefielding right now. It's just not, it's not doing it for me. Um, 
like I said, I keep it a hundred. I don't care. <laughs> so like uh, any critique should be a critique for, to do better, uh, to make it better for the community. Community has been waiting a long time for a modernized game. I'm like, yeah, y'all had a chance because all the stuff that's happening with Activision right now, <laughs> y'all had a chance. Uh, and aside from the outside of video game stuff that they're dealing with, uh, corporate wise, you had their game Vanguard, which take place once again in well, World War II. Like people want modernized things. And um, I'm just really disappointed that the guns in Vanguard sounds way better than the guns in 2042, the sound of them. I've never experienced that with a Call of Duty versus Battlefield. So. Would you prefer to for them to keep developing the game another three, six months and you get it later? And if you were for access to it now and wait for the patches. I mean, it released, so <laughs> it's a I release. Mean, now, but I, yeah. Yeah, but if if this is see, this is the problem that, for example, like Cyberpunk, right? Um, you have a lot of these consumers out here. It's like are they consumers, are they customers? Like you have a lot of them out here that will try to bully a game to finally release. And when a game is so advantageous, you cannot do that. Like let that joint simmer, let it like, <laughs> let it kind of marinate in the oven for as many months that is need to be, just as long as they don't forget the project and it goes left field. Cyberpunk was one of those games that it should have just came out this year instead of, you know, last year. So. Um, because the game is an open world game. It's the same with Battlefield. It is a huge game. And y'all charging this amount for this title, yet you have no story mode. Um, you don't have a lot of modes in the game. And then you don't even have a lot of guns in the game. And then there's nothing alluring that will make you want to keep playing it. There's no type of... Re like in previous Battlefields, if I'm a medic... If I'm able to do more of my medic stuff, I'm able to unlock this certain gun that no one else can unlock unless they're able to play the class that they are at their respective value of what they're supposed to do. And this one, it's like you just level up, you know, if you want some uh, 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 emblem. I don't give a damn about no emblem. <laughs> I want <laughs> the guns and the attachments, you know, maybe some skins for the guns or something to make it look cool. But it's nothing alluring to make it come back. And I'm like, I lost the first thing about gamification. The person must feel rewarded for playing or doing something. So right now, it's like you just playing, like just to play and level up your character. But what am I leveling up for? Like, what am I getting in return? Am I getting new guns? Am I getting new attachments? Like something special? What makes it special for me to want to play this the specialist or this class, it's just too much, it's too much. So I would prefer to answer your question is always for developers, for publishers to respect developers, to let them have their say so and when a game should be released and when it should not be released. A lot of people always blame developers and developers is like, we don't own a company, we just work here. <laughs> like, so... It's the publishers, it's the suits. They want this game out a certain time according to this, this, and that, and then turn around and sue the company that we that you told us to do this. Like that's that's the whole thing with CD Project Work Right. So with EA, EA, this is another game um that did not launch good. The, you know, the last EA game that didn't launch good from the Battlefield franchise was four. And that's when the PS4 first came out. You can even play the damn story mode. So Please fix the game. You know, I, I get these these advantageous type games, for example, like Destiny 2. It took them a while to fix certain things. Rainbow Six, it took them a while. No Man's Sky. I hope they are, you know, the worth ethic of the publisher understands the developers to let this game get fixed uh, because we really want a Battlefield game. Review by Red. Yes. <laughs> review. <laughs> the review. Guys, I don't know what's happening. I need my, I need to snipe. And people are not getting snipped when I snipe at them. And that's not, I don't, 
That gonna make me go to Heartline. Like that game came out when? <laughs> but uh, Halo's fun. I don't know if y'all had a chance to play Halo. Uh, Halo's fun. Uh, Vanguard. I'm very impressed with Call of Duty Vanguard coming off. I was not so impressed with Cold War. Uh, but Vanguard is actually fun. So I don't know if y'all gonna end up on there. Let me know. I should. We should get on that. <laughs> Yes, get on that. Let me know. Um, just understand this for anyone that comes across my streams or come across me in a game. You will hear a lot of words used yeah. <laughs> playing Call of Duty. I have to rage. It, it helps me. It gives me more power. OK, it gives me power. Just let me just let me say what I got to say. <laughs> but yeah, we definitely need to play Vanguard. But Red, I appreciate you jumping in with us. Um, any last topic you want to discuss, Marcus? No, uh, what do y'all got going on this week? Hmm. Thanksgiving's coming up. Man. That's right. A food day. A food yeah. day. <laughs> I'm trying to finish up the book this week, hopefully. I got to write the introduction this weekend. Um, I put a section in actually, you remember the old school gaming magazines that come with the CDs with the demos on it? I got an entire chapter called Game Demos. It's like 20 pages of games that the developers oh, wow. put the demos in there. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. Nice. I, gotta, I still got to give you my drop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we got to connect after this. That's so just... many moving pieces. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, besides food day, um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, more streams. I actually have to do an unboxing for EA for Battlefield. Uh, they sent something really cool. I don't know what this is, but it was a 30 pound package. Oh, and uh, we're going we're gonna to see what this is. Uh, a stream on Halo Infinite. Uh, I played several matches. Uh, Shouts out to the Grown Woman Gaming Podcast. It's a group, uh, black owned, all black female uh host definitely check them out i got to game with them and we were having a blast i don't think they had any idea that it was a squad full of black women just <laughs> and everybody up on halo um but i love the way the game feel i'm gonna try and uh test it out on the pc i got this just played on the series x and uh streams on uh, some other following games coming up I know February period is packed with so many titles. It's ridiculous. So it's just kind of time to trim the backlog for content. I'm going to check out, I'm going to download Vanguard. I might, I might download Halo for you to see what you looking like on there. Okay. All right. Just add me. Right. Uh, I will be on Vanguard tonight. <laughs> put in some work we got to figure out some other games it'll be dope to actually have like a community uh night to play with some of our viewers um that'll be cool just like we was doing knockout city um derek you entered any tournaments with knockout city or like what's going on with the knockout no, city I, community? I didn't even get to check out the new um uh, stuff that they added on knockout city i need to get on i haven't turned on the playstation 5 and i don't know how long i need i was playing um I'm busy Deadpool. I didn't even finish that. I got to a certain point and just put it down. So uh, had to get productive. So Deadpool game is it the same? The Marvel Deadpool? Um, Death Dead Loop or Death Loop? What is it? Oh, Death, Death, Death Loop. Loop. My man yeah, said Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah, Deadpool. Death Loop. <laughs> man, how did I miss that? <laughs> yeah. They have a lot of nominations for Game of the Year. Uh, both the voice actors, the actress, they uh nominated for best voice actor and actress of the year. Oh, wow. uh, Deathloop have, I think, either four of either four nominations for Game of the Year at the, the, the Game Awards. I'm pretty sure they have some other awards too at other award shows, but um, it's just great to see a game that has a black developer uh, on it and also two black leads rack up some uh, awards. And, you know, last time I seen that was The Walking Dead with the character Lee and Clementine. So um as black characters that actually won game of the year. So um yeah, it's great to see. 
is this uh the Halo the Master Chief collection? Is that what I'm getting? No, bro. The Halo Infinite is free on Game Pass. Got it. All you gotta yeah. do is just download it. That's You'll good. be good. All right. Casey it Casey come. from from Tampa is saying that there's a, a school in DC that has a uh, let's see the world's only university designed for the deaf and hard of hearing. They start an esports program. Oh, that's amazing. It's actually an organization too. Yeah, I definitely got to check that out. I wonder if able gamers know of this school too. Able Game is a really awesome organization. Dope. Well, shout out so to our it, audience. Appreciate y'all stopping in. Yeah, for sure. You'll see us here again next week, every week, Sunday, 8 p.m. EST. Red, I got to catch up with you about the book. Uh, shout out to Casey again here from Tampa, supporting us here. Um, and, and be on the lookout for some more stuff about Beyond Meta coming up in February, mid-February 17th. February, February 11th and 12th. 11th and 12th. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Y'all have a good night. Peace, y'all.